Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar. Today's webinar is part of the Rethink Energy Series co-organized by the IIEA and the ESB. To kick us off, we're going to just have a, um, a first introduction from Jim Dollard, who is the Director of ESB Generation and Trading. Let me hand over to you, Jim. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Lisa. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the ESB, I'm delighted to welcome you to the latest lecture in the Rethink Energy Series in conjunction with the IAEA. Um, it's rare I use the word excited. I am excited to be at this lecture today, um, and maybe I'll explain why. Um, ESB has a net zero by 2040 strategy. That is a really ch challenging target for us as a, as a utility. And I, as Director of Generation, um, you know, have a key responsibility in reducing emissions. Um, we see a zero, a net zero reality for our generation business across three key planks, renewables, large scale renewables, dispatchable generation, which will be important. And most importantly, in the context of this conversation, storage. Storage is going to be a huge part of our future. When we look at, I suppose, the history of this island and energy security, and I suppose the very makeup of the electricity system, in the past, in the recent past, we had up to 90 days of, of energy storage for electricity on this island. By 2030, as we progress, we'll have less than, less than a week, probably closer to five. And when you look at that future and an intermittent renewables future, it's clear as we look forward that intermittent renewables, which we are absolutely adamant to, to drive out, will require storage, large scale storage. We are going to play a part in, in you know, shorter term batteries, and we are rolling out currently 300 megawatts of batteries, but long term seasonal storage uh, is going to be required on this island. And you know, under certain circumstances, we believe Ireland in itself will need 10 terawatt hours of storage you know, in a relatively short time frame. So that's something like 20 times, for those of you who are familiar with the Irish system, Turlock Hill, which is you know, a massive achievement in its day, 20 Turlock Hills in the context of the storage we need. You know, Ireland is is driving towards, you know, a net zero. I suppose government policy has, you know, laid the groundwork. But we believe large scale storage, as I said, is going to be a key part of that. And green hydrogen is a key part of getting or enabling the storage. I'm pleased to say in recent weeks, um, the government has, has launched a national hydrogen policy and ESB fully supports that. We fully support the steps that that the government are setting out now in terms of hydrogen and related storage. ESB in conjunction with DeCarbonX, and this was their partner, SNAM, are intent on building large scale storage projects around the island of Ireland, but also in terms of building green hydrogen clusters as part of that. We see that as a really important part of our remit as we go forward, but also very important for the island. We're looking forward to the publication next week, I believe, or the week after of the uh, energy security review from the government. And we think that would be really important in this context. And I suppose when you stand back, as we see it now, I've said there's three aspects to a net zero world from a generation perspective, storage, dispatchable uh, generation and renewables. And today we're talking about storage, which is a key plank. So we are excited, really excited. When you look at where we have to go in terms of storage, to hear what Professor Chris Llewellyn Smith has to say in terms of the type of infrastructure that we will need for a resilient energy system, the scale of that challenges of that challenge and the developments that are happening elsewhere. So I hope you all enjoy this session. We're really looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, that's great. Um, so let's move on. We're really delighted to be joined today by Professor, sorry, Professor Sir Chris Llewellyn Smith. Um, he is Emeritus Professor at the Department of Physics in the University of Oxford. And um, Sir Chris will speak to us for about 20 to 25 minutes or so, and then we will go to a Q&A with the audience. Um, so if you're at ESB headquarters, you can join the discussion um, using Slido, um, and you can enter the code 1927123. I hope you got that. And if you're watching the, the event remotely, you can use the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, which you should see on your screen. So um, regardless of which way you're joining the Q&A, please give your name and the name of your organization when asking your, qu your question. Um, and so you can put these you know, in the Q&A throughout the session as they're occurring to you. Um, and then we'll come to them at the end of the presentation um, after Chris has finished. 
So I, I should remind you that this is being recorded um, and both the, the presentation but also the Q&A discussion will be, both be on the record. And we'd also encourage you to join the discussion um, using the Twitter handle at IIEA. Um, okay, so I will now formally introduce uh, Sir Chris Llew Llewellyn-Smith and then hand over. Um, Chris is Emeritus Professor, as I said already, and he's recently launched the study by the, he led the launch study by the Royal Society on Large Scale Energy Storage. Um, Chris has, among other things, served as the Director of Energy Research at the University of Oxford from 2011 to 17. He has been the President of the Council of the Synchrotron Light for Experimental Science and Applications in the Middle East, and he was Director General of CERN when the Large Hadron, uh, Hadron Collider was approved and construction was started. So um, Professor uh, Llewellyn Smith's contributions to theoretical particle physics and leadership have been recognized by awards and honors worldwide, including election to the Royal Society, which awarded him a Royal Medal in 2015. So I would like to uh, join you all in welcoming um, uh, Professor Sir Chris Llewellyn Smith to give his presentation. We're very excited to hear more about energy storage and particularly as Jim Dollard has outlined in the context of our rising share of renewables in Ireland. So over to you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. So let me start by getting up my slides. Um, here we go. So we'll get into slideshow. Is that visible? It is. Okay, so I'm drawing on the report that we recently published, which is about the situation in Great Britain, but the lessons we've learned are more generally applicable. And I will be saying some things about the situation in Ireland and the rest of Europe and the rest of the world. So I'd like to start with as a sort of amuse bouche with a list of points that I'm going to make, and then I'm going to work through those points and joined up the dots. And those points are that as fossil fuels are phased out, an increasing share of final energy will be provided by electricity. As electricity is decarbonized, an increasing fraction will be provided by wind and solar. High levels of wind and solar must be complemented by storage or large-scale low-carbon flexible supply. The need for long-term storage and or flexible supply has generally been seriously underestimated because the periods that have been studied in most of the studies are not long enough. Despite the fact that the need is bigger than some people have thought, the storage needs can be met while keeping the average costs of electricity at a reasonable level. But it's not going to happen unless markets reward the provision of uh, storage adequately. Finally, in Great Britain, long-term storage will be best provided by storing hydrogen in solution mined salt caverns, but other solutions, as I will discuss, are available in regions without salt deposits. So here's my first point. I think we all know this, that as we uh, move out of using fossil fuels in transport, heating our homes and industry, they'll be largely replaced by electricity, and as electricity is decarbonized, it will be replaced. A lot of it will be provided, um, increasing fraction will come from wind and solar because they're very abundant and they're cheap. Now, high levels of wind and solar must be complemented by storage um, or, and or low cost flexible supply. And as I've said, the need has been generally underestimated. So that begs the question, why is storage and or flexible supply needed? And how should the need for storage or flexible supply be met? So wind and solar vary on timescales from minutes up to, as we'll see, decades. You can easily install more than enough generation capacity for wind and solar to meet uh, more than demand on average. And But there are times when there is no wind. The wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining. And those... That really happens. So, but on the other hand, electricity and supply and demand must exactly balance at all times or the lights go out. So to deal with those times when there's none and you want the lights to stay on, we must complement large scale wind and solar by storing excess wind and solar to use later and or adding large scale zero or low carbon flexible sources. There must be large scale because we're talking about large scale wind and solar. 
but there aren't many of them. The large scale low carbon sources are nuclear, but it's expensive and it's especially expensive if you try to operate it flexibly. Bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, it's expensive. And if you built it, since it's carbon negative, you'd like to operate it flat out, not flexibly. Gas with carbon capture and storage, again, it's expensive and even more expensive if you operate it flexibly, and it's not zero carbon. In some countries, you can get a lot of hydro, but in Great Britain and Ireland, there is some hydro okay, but it's not large scale on the scale of the whole electricity demand. Now, how should the demand be assessed? You need to compare wind and solar supply with demand, hour by hour, or shorter periods if you have the data, over as long a period as possible. In Great Britain, we are using in the a model provided by consultancy, AFRI, of 570 terawatt hours of demand. Uh, that's about twice today's. And we've looked at 37 years of wind and solar supply modeled on the basis of real wind and solar data. So there's actual weather data. That period is probably not long enough. And I can't stress enough that you must look at long periods. Now, uh, if I set the average wind and solar over 37 years to be equal to the average demand, then if you had storage that was 100% efficient and you stored every puff of wind and every ray of sunshine, since we've set supply equal to demand, you could meet demand, but you couldn't meet it instantaneously. So here, for example, this in black is the model of demand higher in the winter than in the summer. This is 2050 demand. Here, um, mix 2080. Uh, solar 20, wind 80, as wind and solar supply. So you see here, there is more wind and solar supply than demand, so you can eat demand and you can put the excess into store. Here you have to take something out of store, then you put more back in store, then you take more out of store and so on and so forth. Now, this sort of time period is what has been the focus of most studies. And most studies talk about long-term storage meaning saying it's more than 12 hours. For me, long-term storage is years. Meeting this need on hours is relatively easy. The real problem is the very long-term needs, as we'll see in a minute. Notice, by the way, that um, people often talk about seasonal storage. Jim just did it. But in fact, if you mix in the British Isles wind and solar appropriately, you can more or less on average balance demand in the winter and the summer, but that it's out of balance in every individual year. So some years you have to transfer furniture from the summer to the winter, some from the winter to the summer, and often between different years. So it's not really seasonality that's the issue, it's volatility. So as I said, the real problem is long-term variability. So here I've plotted the same sort of thing as here, with supply set equal to demand over 37 years. Actually, there's only 36 years here. I didn't want to split the winters, so I took years from beginning of April to the end of March. Now, here in a given year is the surplus, um, with everything normalized to be 570 terawatt hours a year. Here's a deficit in this year. There's a surplus here and so on. And because I've set them equal on average, the number, the surpluses and the deficits are exactly equal. So if I stored all the surpluses, I could fill the deficits. But the problem comes here. Look at this, or the, it's particularly clear here. Here are three years where in succession, there's very, very little wind. You can't fill these deficits with energy stored here. There's not enough. Or here, it's in deficit. In fact, you've got to use energy that's been in the store from the very beginning, 30 years before. So the message, and this is true also when I add in efficiencies, is that we need to store tens of terawatt hours in Great Britain for decades. Now, uh, if you're going to store a lot of energy for as long as that, 
you've got to have something which is very cheap per unit of energy stored. And storing hydrogen in solution mine salt caverns is by far the best option in Great Britain. You couldn't conceivably do this with batteries. You'd be bankrupt in a couple of weeks if you built that much storage. Nor could you do it with pumping water up into dams and taking it out again. This need is a thousand times what we have in Great Britain for pumped hydro storage. And you could increase that, but not more than a factor of 50% or something. So as I've said, and it's already clear back here actually, that the, you've got to look at very long periods. And if you look at short periods, as most studies have, you will underestimate the need for storage. So let me come back to that. And I want to show this in what I will call a benchmark model. So this is a model which I am not advocating, in which the only thing you have is hydrogen storage and wind and solar supply. You've got to have a little bit more than that because there are very short term demands, for, very rapid demands for electricity when part of the system fails or the proverbial cup of tea at the half time in the FA Cup final or whatever. And for that, you need some storage that can respond in milliseconds. That will be provided by batteries. But meeting that need takes very little energy. So we don't have to take it into account in modeling, though we do put it into account in the cost. Now, in a minute, I'm going to add other things. I'm not advocating this benchmark model. We'll add other stores and sources of supply. But let's start with this simple model to get oriented. In this simple model, this is the level of hydrogen in the store over 37 years. It's jumping up and down every hour, but there are 330,000 hours here, so you can't see that. The resolution's not good enough. Now, the important thing to say is that if I forget the contingency, the size of this store is the difference between the maximum and the minimum. It's about 100 terawatt hours of hydrogen energy. If I'd studied these 23 years in the middle, the difference between the maximum and the middle, minimum, instead of being 100, would be 50. I'd have got the wrong answer. Uh, I'd have built a system which had too little storage to work over 37 years by a factor of two. And as I said, most studies have looked at single years. 23 years gets the answer wrong by a factor of two. So you can imagine it's worse if you only look at a single year. Now, uh, to allow for this, um, the fact that uh, a lot of uncertainties and climate change and so on, we have put contingency here. I could talk about the effects of climate change. Nevertheless, although these needs are very large, by the way, these units here, this is not actually at the cost minimum. If you go up a little bit in energy, this number drops quite rapidly, but you need to provide more wind and solar. These needs, although very large, can be met while keeping the cost of electricity at a reasonable level. So here's the average cost in this case at slightly higher energy. And it depends. It depends on the cost of wind and solar. It depends on the cost of storage. It depends on the discount rate. It varies in our modeling from something like 52 pounds a megawatt hour to 92 pounds a megawatt hour. Is that high or low? In the last decade, the, he said, the wholesale cost of electricity in the Great Britain was about 46 pounds a megawatt hour. So it's higher than that, but who said decarbonization will be cheap? On the other hand, in almost the whole of 2022, it was over 200 pounds a megawatt hour. And I happen to have looked at the number exactly a month ago. I haven't looked today, I'm afraid. It was 92 pounds at the top of this range. So this somewhere in the middle of this range, we reckon using storage is what, what it will cost. So it's cheaper, more expensive than in the last decade, but it's cheaper than what we've become used to living with. Now this average cost is a combination of direct supply, wind and solar going directly into the grid, which in this case costs about 36 pounds a megawatt hour, and the energy from storage, which is 200 pounds a megawatt hour. How come I can get a, an average which is about 60 pounds? The answer is that this 38 
6.6 pounds, the amount going directly into the grid is about 85% of demand, and this 200 pounds is only meeting 15% of demand. So we have a situation with a reasonable average, which is made of a, a very cheap direct supply and extremely expensive storage. And the immediate question is, how are we going to find investors who are willing to fund this expensive part, which is essential, the system won't work without it, but expensive. And that is a really big issue, which I will return to. Now, let's go beyond this benchmark model here. So I'm going to go beyond it by looking at adding ammonia storage, nuclear base load, flexibly operating gas plus CCS, and then imports. So ammonia could do the whole job. And the advantage of that is you could put it anywhere. Uh, and as we'll see in a minute, there's only a certain number of places in Great Britain you could put hydrogen storage. And in Ireland, the only place is up in the north of Ireland, from Larne inwards. Um, so it will be, and then if everything is stored in one place, you may get grid congestion problems transmitting the electricity. So it's interesting to think about using something else. Not saying you would use ammonia to do everything, you'd use as much hydrogen as you could, but you might want to use some ammonia, even if you've got the capability of storing hydrogen, it will be more expensive, five pounds out of about 60. To store ammonia, you store it in tanks like this, which would store 500,000 tons. That's about a quarter of a terawatt hour. In the island of Ireland, you'd need about 40 such tanks if you did everything with ammonia, which I'm certainly not advocating. That's not an unimaginable number. Now, there's another important market problem here. If you have several types of store, how are you going to use them? Supposing I know that in the next hour, there's going to be surplus wind and solar. Do I put it in the ammonia store? Do I put it in hydrogen? Do I put it in batteries? Supposing that I know there's going to be a deficit, which store do I call on to take the energy out to fill that deficit? You need a protocol that minimizes the cost. Uh, we have developed such a protocol as best we can, but implementing that protocol requires collaboration between generators of the operators of storage at a level that doesn't exist. So that's another market problem. Now, what about nuclear base load? Uh, nuclear base load will increase the average cost of electricity unless nuclear costs less per megawatt hour. I've said that sentence twice, there's a mistake there. Unless nuclear costs less per megawatt hour than the average cost per megawatt hour without it. So if you look at the range I had, 52 pounds to 92 pounds, most estimates of nuclear are in the upper half of that. So what I'm saying here is that nuclear will increase the cost unless it's at the bottom of the range of most people's expectations and storage is towards the top of the range. Uh, you can add nuclear, it will decrease the amount of hydrogen storage you need, but you're still gonna need in Great Britain tens of terawatt hours. What about flexibly operating gas plus CCS? You don't want too much because uh, CCS isn't perfect, it, there is some carbon dioxide is left, and you've got to worry about leakage of methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. That could lower the cost, but whether it would do so very much depends on what gas is going to cost in 2050, which was our target date for our study. And if you know what gas is going to cost in 2050, please tell me. So this is an interesting thing to think about. Whether it would lower the cost is not at all obvious. There are some sets of values that lowers it, but for many others, it doesn't. What about imports? No question that importing and exporting electricity will make it easier to manage the system. But you should not design a system that cannot meet demand when imports are not available. Imports are not available in occasional low wind periods that cover most of Northern Europe, and these are during anti-cyclones, so it's cold and demand is high. So there are periods when there's nothing available to import. So it's no good uh, us in Great Britain coming to you 
in Ireland or going to Belgium or France or Germany or Norway saying, can we import some of your electricity? There's no wind here and it's cold. And they'll say, we haven't got it. It's cold here also. And we haven't got any wind. So imports will matter, but you shouldn't rely on them. Now, let's now talk about um, what happens in other places in the world. Solutions, this was one of my first points, other than hydrogen are available in other countries where the need may not be so great. So let's first of all look at the need in the rest of the world and then the other solutions in areas where salt deposits, there are no salt deposits, uh, therefore that's not an option. Now, uh, it's confusing. To, oh, here we go. So the interdecadal wind variation, which you saw in those plots I showed you with those years with very low wind, is especially large in Northern Europe. And by the way, people who've modeled Germany come to very, which you know, their wind will come from the North Sea and the Northern Germany also reach very similar conclusions uh, relative to demand that we have reached. Now, the available evidence suggests that while Northern Europe is particularly bad, it's not an extreme outlier. And that wherever you are in the world, studies that looked at very short periods are misleading. On the other hand, we haven't modeled the rest of the world. I can't tell you the exact storage need, but I think I can go from Great Britain to Northern Ireland and agree with what Jim said, you're gonna need about 10 terawatt hours. What if no suitable salts available? So using hydrogen is not an option. So it may be possible to store hydrogen in aquifers, uh, this is um, sandstone underground, or in depleted gas fields. Now, the problem with this is that this has never really been done. There is one test of using depleted gas fields that began in Austria in April this year. There was a monumental study of these possibilities by the International Energy Agency last year. It says that hydrogen and aquifers is uh, technology readiness, readiness level two to three. They use a scale that goes up to 12, by the way. And depleted gas fields is at three. So we don't know if that's possible. It would be very desirable if it was possible because it would allow us to store hydrogen in many different places. But be a little bit careful. The advocates of this idea claim that it will lower the cost because you don't have to dig a hole in the ground. But that's not true. The cost of storing hydrogen in salt caverns is mainly in the surface facilities of compressing the hydrogen and cleaning it when it comes out again. And if you store it in aquifers or depleted gas fields, you need more cleaning. So it's probably the case that using aquifers or depleted gas fields will be more expensive than using salt caverns. But this has not really been studied. There is a depleted gas field 50 kilometers south of Cork, a Kinsale head, which produced something like 5.7 billion cubic meters of, um, of, of natural gas. It in principle could store something like five or six terawatts, meeting half hydrogen's needs. That's a very interesting possibility. If you can't use uh, any of these things, you can use ammonia, it's a bit more expensive. Or the other long-term option is to make hydrocarbons out of captured CO2, e-fuels they're called, e-methanol will be the best. Now, just a brief word about salt deposits to see where they are. So here's a map of the salt deposits in Europe. There are three different types, some in green, some in yellow, some in blue. Now, in Great Britain, the most promising area is here in North Yorkshire, actually. There are some good situations in Cheshire and down here in Wessex. And there is some in Northern Ireland. But you see, although there are uh, in Poland and Northern Germany and parts of Spain quite a lot, there's very little in France. So this is not available everywhere. In the United States, these are the areas in yellow where there are salt deposits. So there's essentially none in the Western United States. This leads you to think about aquifers and aquifers here, everything that isn't brown actually. So there's quite a lot here in, in, in Ireland. Uh, there's quite a lot here in France where there weren't any salt caverns and so on. The trouble with using aquifers is not just that it's at 
um, technology re level, readiness level two to three. But if you ask people who talk about it, they can tell you all about where the aquifers are. But they, when you ask them how much could it store, they say, oh, that needs more work to find out. But using aquifers or depleted gas fields would enable large scale hydrogen storage in regions that are remote from salt uh, deposits. And that will provide important systems benefits. In Great Britain, it would allow us to put storage anywhere and it would solve the, it would avoid the possibility of grid congestion. This means there's a compelling case for carrying out the additional work and trials that are needed to see if these are realistic options. So let me finish. Large scale storage is going to play a crucial role in decarbonizing the electricity system and hence the whole energy system in all regions that rely heavily on wind and solar. The level of storage that's needed has been seriously underestimated by the many studies that looked at a single year. And I'm sorry to say that our Committee of Climate Change and National Infrastructure Commission have both relied on consultants who only looked at one year. So they've come up with answers that are just much too small. In Great Britain, the average cost of electricity with high wind and solar will be higher than in the last decade, but quite probably less than it is today. A mix of technologies will probably lower the production cost, and it may make economic sense to add some gas plus CCS, but this will not remove the need for large health scale hydrogen storage. It might reduce it from say 90 terawatt hours to 70 for Great Britain, but not to 10. Elsewhere, modeling that looks at long periods is needed before the optimum solutions can be identified. And everywhere there is a need for large scale demonstrators and large scale deployment as soon as the core needs are clear. And that in certainly in Great Britain, we should be going ahead, building a lot of hydrogen storage as fast as possible so we can find out what it really costs and by learning, speed up the process. And finally, market structures that incentivize the required investment and support the efficient use of storage will be an absolute prerequisite. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. That was really fascinating. Um, it's something I think that we've all considered uh, over our in our research from time to time. So um, it was really nice to have an overview and really see the in-depth research. I agree with you that this the issue of long term and what does long term mean is, mean is something that I think isn't given enough consideration. Um, OK, so we have some questions coming in. So maybe I will just start to get through those. Um, we have a question from my own research institute here, UCD's Energy Institute from Hussein and Azimbadi. From the point of view of resource adequacy, can we take? how can we take into account storage as a firm capacity? What key metrics should be considered in derating storages? Hmm, I'm not sure exactly. Do you? I'm not sure I understand that question. I'm not sure I do either. Um, maybe we can come back to that. We will ask an ESB question here from Diego Estrada. Do you think we will see fusion nuclear energy being commercial anytime soon to meet okay. the net zero goals? Slightly different question, but. Well, I know something about that question. I led I the British fusion program and I chaired the World Fusion Project ETA. When I got into fusion, which was in 2003, I thought that uh, it could compete with wind and solar. But what has happened? Wind and solar has gone down in cost faster than the greenest green could have dreamt in their best possible dream. On the other hand, the cost of fusion, it's become clear, was grossly underestimated. We've seen that with the ETA project. So two things that we thought could compete have diverged radically. And I cannot see uh, fusion becoming competitive in the ways currently envisaged. Um, at all. Uh, that doesn't mean it couldn't happen. It could happen if there are breakthroughs in controlling turbulence and new types of fusion, but they're not on the horizon as far as I know. So I think we need to continue with the world project to answer some fundamental questions about whether we can use fusion even in principle. 
but we certainly is not going to be there at large scale by 2050. And I will be surprised if it's there competitively, even in the long run, rather than that. Hmm, interesting. I think it seems like nuclear fusion is the one that we think about every time we're feeling a little desperate nearly, isn't it? But I agree with you, the costs of wind and solar, it's unbelievable how they've come down over the last uh, decade or so. OK, so moving on to some other question from Aidan McAleer. What are the potential synergies or trade offs between large scale storage and other flexibility op options such as demand response, interconnection and distributed generation? OK, so uh, we, we've looked at all those things. We haven't modeled interconnectors. We've just concluded that we better design a system and cost it a system that doesn't rely on them. But now, one of the things, one of our recommendations is we have not taken into account uh, the location of supply, demand, and storage. So we've, we've identified the key needs, and that's an input to a study that now needs to be done, taking account the fact that there will be some hydro, there will be some nuclear, uh, where the things are, what happens to the grid, what interconnectors there are, and things like that. Now, as far as demand management is concerned, if you look at that period when the level in the store got very low, and I showed you the filling factor, the amount of hydrogen in the store, uh, that you cannot deal with by demand management. Uh, it's just much too big. And conventional demand management simply shifts demand by a few hours. So it will change the short term needs if you shift demand a few hours, but it won't change the long term needs. On the other hand, we've looked at something, and this is in the supplementary information to our report, which you can find on the web, uh, which I don't believe has been studied before. That's to say something that I call preemptive demand management. So the Met Office, the British Met Office, will now give you predictions three months ahead of whether there's how much wind there's going to be. So we've taken that and we've said, supposing every time we see three months coming up, in which the wind is going to be less than 80% of the normal, and we cut demand in that period, um, what could we save? And it's quite interesting. We find that cutting demand by even 2.5%, which would be rather easy to do with higher tariffs, tariffs for big users that you know, required them to use less at certain times, cutting in actually 44 months out of 37 years, that's a relatively small amount, uh, you could reduce the size of the storage we need by 10%. Now, that actually, that doesn't seem much because the cost of the storage is actually rather small because storage is only meeting 15% of demand and the store, a third of the cost is in making hydrogen, a third of it is in turning it back into power, roughly, and a third is in the storage. So the cost of storage is only 5%. So I can add 20% to the store and it only costs me a pound a megawatt hour. So it's quite all right to have that 20% from that point of view. And you say, why bother to save 10%? Answer is building all that storage by 2050 or 2040 you're wanting to do in Ireland be very, very difficult. And every bit you can save will make it easier to construct the enormous wind and solar capacity and volume of storage that's gonna be needed. So I think this long-term demand management will be very helpful and something that needs more study. We've only touched the surface of modeling of that in the last few weeks. I see, okay. Um, how do we plan for the possible additional variability in wind that may be caused by climate change itself? For example, okay. changing in the Gulf Stream patterns exactly. that's from Terence and work from IIA and ESB. So, um, yes, then I, maybe should have included the answer to that on a slide, but you know this wasn't in our talk. Uh, the answer is we, very early on, we went to the Met Office and we said, what's going to be the effect? And they've published papers on it and we studied the papers. And the sort of uh, establishment line is that the effect of climate change um, will, it will have, uh, it will leave interact, so it's another word, that after climate change in 2050, say, the interannual variability will be much the same as today. First point. Second point, that interannual variability is going to be bigger than the effect of climate change. Now, if that's right, 
since we've used historical data that has an interannual variability that's not going to change in the future, a, a much according to the canonical view, uh, and is going to be bigger than the climate change, we think we're all right to forget about climate change. Although part of the reason for adding that 20% contingency was precisely because we don't know the answer to that. However, what I would say is the, the contingency, of course, you would build last. You don't build the contingency and not use it. Uh, and by the time you get around to building that, we're going to know a hell of a lot more about the, the modeling climate change and what climate change is actually doing. But at least according to the experts on the weather, uh, what we've done is OK as far as climate change is concerned. But it's a very, very good question. I see. I suppose a related question to that is from... Um... One of the audience member has the seasonality impact of electrification of heat being considered. In other words, there'll be much higher yes. Yes. electrical demand in winter. Yes, that's yes. So the model we used from this consultancy, AFRI, it has um it has electric vehicles in it, which is sort of around the world around the year. So that just increases demand. It doesn't in fact yeah. it decreases the variability because it's there in the winter and the summer. Although people use their cars a bit more in the summer. Um and we included it includes a lot of electrical heating. So, um, but we looked at that. So we took their model. This wasn't condoned by then. And I played games with it. I added a, a lot more electricity and heating, and a lot less. We varied demand up and down by uh, from 570 down to 440, and up to 700. This is the demand that's into the grid, by the way, before transmission losses. And they had a very different profile when we did that. And it changed, of course, if I put in more demand, I need more wind and solar and I need more storage. But it's the cost per megawatt hour of the power you get out is very, very insensitive to the profile and the level of demand. So we did indeed, you can find that in the report. Okay. Okay, I have quite a few questions coming in now. Very interesting. I, I suppose one thing that we didn't get into is how do you expect the hydrogen will be turned back into electricity? Is that gas turbines or fuel cells? Or That's a very good question. So most studies of um, hydrogen assume there'll be combined cycle turbines or PEM cells, fuel cells. Uh, we actually think we think that uh, combined cycle turbines will be much more expensive than PEM cells. But we think that cheaper than either could be using four-stroke engines. Mm. Now, people get very surprised by that, and they say four-stroke engines are such a good deal. Why are we not using them with natural gas? And the answer is, we are. There is a 600-megawatt power station in Jordan operated entirely with four-stroke engines powered by natural gas. And the uh, it used to be said that... up. Four-stroke engines are only a good way of making electricity up to about 100 megawatts. But if you talk to the experts now, that transition point is around 300 megawatts or maybe higher. I don't know what. Now, one of the good things about using a four-stroke engine is the individual ones are quite small, maybe 20 megawatts. So that's exactly what you want if you're dealing with a variable demand. So you have a lot of small systems and you either operate them at the absolute uh, you know, optimum operating point or you turn them off. So you vary them by having a large number and either having fully on or fully off. You don't flex them, which makes them inefficient. Now, the interesting thing is that with most of the work on four-stroke engines started by people thinking of putting them in cars, hydrogen engines, and they just took conventional car engines and said, what would happen if you put hydrogen into them? That turns out not to be the best operating regime. People started to worry about NOx, and they found that it's much better to go to a very lean beat burn where it's rather efficient. So there are a number of companies, Mercedes, Toyota, others who are looking now at hydrogen engines. And in the UK, the big one is JCB, the people who make those yellow diggers. They, are again, they have prototypes of a rather efficient, in fact, um, hydrogen engine that they want to put into diggers. Uh, I haven't told them yet it's going to be a big market for you making power from hydrogen as well. <laughs> okay. Um, right, so I have to, I'm going to have to be selective here, I think. 
Well, I have one thing close to my heart. I don't know if this is something within your remit. Do you have suggestions as to how the electricity market should be restructured to remunerate long term storage? OK, um, so, I mean, the, the first thing to realize that you know people say, oh, you have a CFD or something like that. Now, those mechanisms, things like, I mean, make a very trivial remark. CFDs are reward output. I mean, you don't want to reward output or the storage stores will be in profit but empty when you need them. What you want to do is pay people for not producing energy. So there's got to be some sort of anti-CFD, you know, reward for keeping your store full. So I think that problem probably not so hard to fix, though it, people don't get their minds around it. Uh, I think the harder one is that I said, if you've got several stores, you've got to work out how to use them. And so you need coordination. So one of the, um, we've thought about two solutions. One, there's a solution that's advocated by my colleague, Dieter Helm, which is that auctions for power should be for firm power. So you say, I'm, I'm, not, I'm only interested if you will, you know, will auction the uh, obligation to be able to definitely produce this amount of power. That would force owners of storage and owners of generation to get together, but they probably are bedfellows actually. And it, you'd start worrying about competition law. So the other thing we thought about is what I call the extended central buyer model. So in principle in Great Britain, we have a liberalized energy market. So it's up to people what they do. In fact, it's not like that. We know that you know the minister stands up on the floor in the House of Commons and says, we're going to build so much wind or we're going to build so much nuclear. It's not a free market at all under political pressure. So people have talked having think, taking that out of political hands and having an agency which has instructions um, to, about carbon, but otherwise has a free hand, who's responsible for buying, you know, uh, deciding what to build and running the auctions. But you could also, that's the central buyer model. The extended central buyer model would say such an agency is also responsible for buying and selling electricity. So they would be a sort of, uh, you know, they wouldn't actually hold it, but they'd say, okay, next hour, I'm going to buy your wind power and I'm going to sell it to these guys operating this store or those guys operating another. Now, if you think about that, that would be extremely like renationalizing operationally, except that it would not put all the risks in the hand of taxpayers. It would, and it wouldn't involve renationalization with a colossal amount of capital, of course. This would be a sort of free way of getting the equivalent of renationalization. Okay. So yeah. I, we, we just put, put that forward as an idea. I don't know the answer. Started but is that agency not the government? Is it not public money? Well, it, it could be. Model? I, I think you want to depoliticize it. So I'm imagining something like the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee, which is okay. you know, it's 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 not it's got political guidelines. You know, reduce inflation in that case, uh, but it's not told what to do. And it could be the ESO, the you know the, the old national grid. That would be a very good candidate for doing this job. The only thing that worries about me about this is that um, I actually spent nine months in the old Soviet Union back in the 60s. And so I know what's wrong with central planning. Uh, the difficulty is I don't see how we can co we can decarbonize without a, a great deal more planning and coordination than we have at present. But what if the planner gets it all wrong? I mean, I'd be happy for you, Lisa, to be the planner, but I might not be happy for me to be the planner. I mean, yeah. that, that's, that, you know, there's a terrible tension here between, at least in, in the central buyer model, you would keep competition in procurement and you would keep competition in generation and storage and so on. But somebody has got to plan the, the thing. That's the hard part. How do you get competition into that? I have no idea. I see. Yeah. Maybe um, our ESB uh, audience might be happy about this. It sounds like we're going back to <laughs> some of the old days, as you say. Um, there was a question about thermal storage. I'm just trying to find you. Have you looked at thermal storage? Yes, I guess yes, we've looked at thermal Thomas storage. Thomas O'Sullivan. And, um, uh, first of all, I should say that we classify stores according to how fast you have to turn over the content to get your money back. 
So lithium ion batteries, if you store for more than three days or something like that, you'll be bankrupt because they're very expensive. You've got to churn it over. Then at the other end, there's e-methanol, ammonia, and hydrogen. You can store for years and still get your money back. And in the middle, there's a whole range. And we list a number of things. Uh, and we just chose to, start, to choose one of them to model because we couldn't model all of them. Uh, so we looked in very great detail at... Uh, advanced compressed air energy storage but thermal storage is the other really good large-scale candidate there's a lot of things you know many a mickle max a sister in scotland you could have a lot of things individually doing a small amount that adds up to a lot but if you want to think of things that individual units can store large amounts of energy you're into large underground compressed air energy systems or very large carno batteries these are vast piles of volcanic rock maybe not piles, put them in old disused quarries or something like that, uh, which you blow hot air through, you get them very hot, ideally up to 600 degrees or something, and then you take the heat out and run a turbine. We've looked at that, and uh, those are quite a promising system. Okay. Okay, we're nearly at the end, so I was going to combine two questions here. One is one that I quite like. Uh, the What are the like, taking into account Ireland size, this is from Tim Preslin, uh, what are the likely research priorities um, that we should be focusing on uh, for research and demonstration? And related to that, I suppose, you know, what? how soon do policymakers need to be working on this? Um, okay, so the, the, the second question, uh, I think is easy to answer, which is as soon as possible. As soon as you can see something we definitely need, get on with it, because, you know, 2050 is pretty close, and if you're going for 2040, it's even closer. By the way, I get quite worried about near-term targets. I mean, our government is talking about decarbonizing electricity in 2035. I think that's possible, but only by building an awful lot of carbon capture and storage uh, with gas. And I think that you know, if you look ahead to 2060, that won't be the right system, and the integrated carbon dioxide will be more. You'll get stranded assets of things. You know, There's a conflict between doing it fast and doing it right. And that's a very difficult one. But I would say as soon as you say things, there's no question that we're going to need you know, whatever it is in hydrogen storage or maybe gas plus DCS. Get on with it and learn how to do it and get the cost done. Now, the R&D priorities, that's difficult because we did this study for the Royal Society and they want me to say research is very important. But anyone who understands the scale of the electricity system knows that nothing is going to save us in 2050, which isn't already being commercialized out of the laboratory today. I can think of one conceivable example, but only one, and that's pretty damn dubious. So the, the real, to my mind, there are R&D priorities. For example, I talked about um, generating power with, pen, with uh, fuel cells, PEM cells. PEM electrolyzers rely on iridium, and that's in short supply. So there's a research priority somewhere in the world, get down the amount of iridium, things like that. But uh, I don't think there are many, to my mind, it's really demonstrators that we need. And I think increasingly, since we started really looking at this question of aquifers, is understanding whether you can use aquifers and depleted gas fields. And I, I suppose people are looking at that because I know that somebody told me yesterday that some company, whoever owns that Kinsale head, is talking of putting hydrogen down there. So they must be thinking about the feasibility. Um, and I know that Central are thinking of the rough field in the North Sea, putting hydrogen into that. But um, so maybe they know something I don't, or they know something that uh, is the people who wrote a 250 page report technical report for the International Energy Agency don't. But those people say that's a TRL3. But but that to my mind that I mean that really make a difference if we can use depleted gas fields and, and aquifers. That's a big priority. Okay. I just want one follow up there, Chris. When I hear aquifers, I sort of feel a bit nervous. Are we are we worried at all about pollution or disturbing the hydrological cycle? Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, well, some of these are they're, they're dry sandstone as well. I, I don't think so. That doesn't seem to be a concern. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I think some of the concerns, yeah, uh, no, that, that that doesn't worry the people. 
well, put it like this, you need to look at this IEA report. There's a lot of discussion of, um, of well, biological reactions in particular um, with hydrogen and other things. But I don't think it's an issue. I mean, one of the issues, by the way, if you make solution mine salt caverns is getting rid of brine. That's an issue too. You probably have to put it out to sea and uh, then, you know, you have to be do that with extreme caution. I mean, we've, we've looked at most of these things and you will find them somewhere in the report or in the supplementary information, which is 200 pages on a break. Well, that's our homework. Um, I think that we have to leave it there because it's just exactly two o'clock. Um, and but I would like to thank you very warmly for uh, for your time, your generous time today. It's a fascinating report. I think it's certainly whetted my appetite. Um, so um, I think we'll wrap up there. I'm sorry for those of you um, that I didn't when I didn't get to your questions. Um, maybe some other time. But in the meantime, I'd like to thank ESB and the IIEA for this providing this webinar and especially to Chris for his time today. And we look forward to looking at the report. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.